do the nut and saddle materials on your acoustic guitar actually make a difference to the sound of your acoustic guitar? Or is that all just marketing malarkey? Today, we're finally going to find out. Stick around. Hello, the internet. My name is Adam from Miller's Custom Guitars. This channel is all about helping you as an instrument owner to be better equipped to be the person servicing your own instruments rather than paying someone else to do it for you. It may require some specialty tools and there may be some specific skills that you need to learn to develop, but this is something that you can learn to do. Yes, you. And if you're interested in learning how, hey, I say go for it. This channel is here to help you on your journey. If you're watching this video, then it's very possible that you have a very simple question that you want answered. The question of nut and saddle materials and how differences in materials may affect the tone on an acoustic guitar. If you can't wait for the answer, heck, I understand. I've got chapter markers for this video in the show notes, and if you want, you can skip ahead to that point of the video to check out the sound samples, and heck, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. I've got those listed in the show notes below. This is the question that we've been looking at during a three-part mini-series. In the first video, we talked extensively about the three primary different materials used for nuts and saddles, plastic, bone, and tusk, and what makes them different. We took an in-depth look at the differences in material costs, as well as how different materials impact the time and labor required for installation. Also in the first video, we went step by step on how to install a saddle from all three different materials, including cutting and shaping a compensated bone saddle from scratch. In the second video, we talked at length about nuts. We discussed about how different materials have different priorities during installation, with plastic focusing on time and cost savings, um, bone focusing on beauty, craftsmanship, durability and tone, and tusk having a higher material costs, but having a simple installation with a consistent tone. We also showed a great way to shim up a nut, much better than just cramming a piece of broken credit card underneath there. I also showed in-depth, step-by-step instructions on how I go about cutting a bone nut from scratch. I detailed every single step, showing some steps that I feel like a lot of other videos skip. Lastly, I showed how to shop for and find the right tusk nut and get that sized properly for your application. However, after all that work, we still haven't played one dang note on the guitar and we haven't finalized the setup on our acoustic guitars. So let's talk about the final setup on an acoustic guitar and then we'll get to the fun part. When doing a setup on any guitar, I like to follow the train method. We've talked about this method on this channel before a number of times, but it always bears repeating. I like this method because it puts all the steps in order and in the order that they need to be addressed in and it has a handy acronym, so you always know what to do next based on what you just did. So let's talk about the steps. However, before I finalize the setup on any guitar, I always like to polish the frets, especially if it's been a while. And I like to clean and oil the fretboard. Um, you can use steel wool, I did that for a long time, but lately I've been using Scotch-Brite pads because they don't leave any metal shavings, which can cause damage to magnetic pickups if you're working on an electric guitar. 
I start with the maroon pad and then move up to the gray pad and then I like to finish with the white pad. Uh, these can be hard to find, but you can buy them from a reputable woodworking supply or online. This just takes a few minutes and leaves the frets refreshed. This shine is not as good as when I take the fretboard over to the polishing wheel, but it definitely gets rid of any tarnish or grime from the frets and fretboard. Then I clean the fretboard with naphtha, or in my case, lighter fluid. Yes, they're basically the same thing, and yes, it's safe to use on your guitar. Here in California, they've basically outlawed naphtha, so I'm using lighter fluid. Spray some on a clean rag and use that to clean the fretboard and then let it gas off. If the fretboard is really grimy, I may use an old toothbrush or sometimes even an old razor blade to scrape away the gunk. Once the fretboard and the frets are completely clean, well, a lot of times that leaves the fretboard super dry, so then I will re-oil the fretboard to restore the color and to help protect it from the dirt and grime that comes from our fingers as we play. As far as what to use to oil the fretboard, um, you can use uh, lemon oil, uh, which is basically just mineral oil with a pleasant scent added, which is great. I used that for a long time. Or you can use plain mineral oil um, or even linseed oil, although it will take a while for that to polymerize and harden. However, you should definitely not use a food grade oil like olive oil or canola oil as these can and will go rancid, causing your fretboard to stink. I've heard of that going happening and it is not a good time. I've used a number of different products, but I'm currently using this product by Dumlop um, because it has a handy applicator and it's easy to go on. It's basically lemon oil. Apply liberally to the entire fretboard. I like to rub it in with my bare fingers, allow it to sit for a minute, and then wipe off the excess. Once all of that is done, it's time to finally start our setup using the train method. So first off, T stands for tune. Look, we've been doing a lot of work to the guitar, and some of that work hasn't necessarily called for the guitar to be tuned to pitch. However, now is the time to tune the guitar to pitch using the final strings that are going to be staying on the guitar. It's important to get the guitar into tune, and specifically the pitch that this instrument is primarily going to be played in. If this guitar is going to be played in standard tuning, well, great. However, if this guitar is going to be played in an alternative tuning like Dadgad or Open G or Drop D or Alpha Q or some other weird tuning I've never heard of. look. When we do the setup, we need to know ahead of time. We need to get the guitar tuned to pitch and the correct pitch for this current setup. I recommend using high quality strings, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Higher quality strings, they don't just sound better and they do sound better, but they will also last longer. They're gonna stay in tune better. Also, one thing about doing a setup is that most of the time, once your guitar is set up with a specific brand and gauge of strings, as long as you keep using the same ones when it's time to change strings, your setup probably won't change. Well, except for seasonal truss rod changes. Speaking of which, bing! The R in train stands for relief. Once the guitar is tuned to the correct pitch, then and only then can we correctly adjust the neck relief. We've talked about this before, especially when I did my video where I demystified some of the confusion surrounding Taylor neck shims. Look, a simple way to check your relief is to put a capo on the first fret and then simply press the strings down basically where the neck meets the body on your guitar. Sometimes that's the 12th fret, sometimes it's the 14th fret. Take a measurement with uh, some feeler gauges or a really precise rule. On electric guitars, you tend to want 
the neck to be either like dead flat or just a tiny bit of relief. Um, I usually shoot for three to five thousandths, maybe as much as seven. However, on acoustic guitars, we tend to allow more relief so that the strings can vibrate a little bit more because they tend to be heavier strings. I usually allow seven to 15 thousandths worth of relief on an acoustic guitar. Usually I will target about 10 thousandths worth of relief. Actually, I personally like to skip the capo altogether and use a notched straight edge, even though this registers off the fretboard rather than off the top of the frets. It lets you know what the neck itself is doing rather than the frets. Make the adjustments to the truss rod. If the gap is too large, tighten the truss rod. If the gap is too small or if your neck maybe has a back bow where the strings are actually touching the frets during the measurement phase, well, heck, then you need to loosen your truss rod. Once the adjustment is where you want it, tune the guitar back to pitch again before moving on to Bing! The A stands for action. We have spent two entire episodes dialing in the action on our replacement nuts and saddles. So this should be pretty easy for us at this point. However, this is pretty serious business. We always move from the nut to the saddle when dealing with action. In this case, we have three separate nuts that are all perfectly dialed in. But now would be the time that I would normally do the tap test uh, to see if my nuts were where I wanted them to be. Then I would move on to the saddle. Uh, measure the string height at the 12th fret using a rule or string height action card. The bass side on an acoustic guitar should be, I don't know, between two and two and a half millimeters. And the treble side should be between one and a half and two millimeters on an acoustic guitar. Uh, if it's too high, you can lower the saddle. If it's too low, you can shim it up using the same method that I showed when I talked about shimming up nuts. If you want more information on dialing your saddle height, check out the first video in the series. And if you want more information on dialing in your nut, check out the second video in this series as we talked about those topics at length. Just one more quick note. Sometimes, especially on acoustic guitars, the action needs more adjustment than you can affect with just the truss rod and the nut and the saddle. In these cases, you may need a neck reset. This is definitely outside of the scope of what you can expect to be able to do yourself and should be done by a skilled luthier or technician. This is a difficult job that is very labor intensive and extremely invasive to the guitar. So it's usually only done to guitars that are worth repairing, so to speak, because it's usually so expensive. If a neck reset sounds like a job that you really want to learn how to do, well, I, there are books that you can buy to teach you how to do it and other YouTube channels that cover this topic in depth. But heck, not very many people want to learn how to do that job. So maybe you have that thing that's broken in your brain in just the right way. So heck, maybe you should uh, consider going to school to learn how to become a luthier if that sounds interesting to you. Anyway, uh, once you've got the truss rod and action taken care of, the next step on the setup train is ding! intonation. Unfortunately, on an acoustic guitar, there's not a whole lot we can do to correct the intonation at this point without major surgery involved. Look, you can make some adjustments to the compensation of the saddle, but that's tricky business once the saddle's already made. If you check the, your intonation and it's pretty close, a lot of times that's close enough <laughs> on an acoustic. If it's way off, look, that's a red flag and you may need to either revisit what's going on with the nut or saddle or 
even have it looked at by a luthier. Once the action is finally dialed in correctly and you've checked the intonation and decided if it's close enough for your liking, tune it back up to pitch again and move on to the last stop on the setup train, which is bing! In for noodle? Yes, noodle. <laughs> Make yourself some ramen and tuck in. No, uh, we just play around a little bit on the guitar. As a technician, I want to play every note and check for fret buzz and to just make sure the notes are ringing true, especially the open notes. But more than that, I just want to play the guitar and make sure that it feels good. Is it easy to play? Does it feel right? Is everything working? Do the notes ring true? It's at this stage that sometimes you realize things you weren't aware of. Maybe you don't need as much relief as you thought you did, or maybe you need more. Maybe there's a high fret that's causing a buzz. I did a setup on a guitar about two weeks ago, and after I got it all the way done, there was a high fret. Maybe one of the fret slots is ringing in a weird way you didn't notice until you really start playing the whole guitar. Maybe the action can come down a little bit after all. All of these issues are fixable. Just loosen the strings and go back and fix those issues. When you do, you will need to go back through the steps of the train method again. However, when you go through those steps subsequent times, it tends to go really quickly. When you finally get it dialed in, your guitar should play the way that you want it to. The last step that I do is to lubricate the nut slots. A lot of times I reach for my tube of Tri-Flow Lubricant, which uses a syringe type applicator to precisely apply lubricant, which contains PTFE. Whether or not you use this on your nut, this is a great lubricant to have in your toolkit to lubricate tuner gears, big speed and other tremolo components, string trees, basically anything on your guitar that moves Another common way to treat nut slots is just to use pencil graphite. I like to use a mechanical pencil because the lead is narrow enough that it will fit in the nut slots. For the guitar that I am setting up today, I'm gonna use Tri-Flow on all three nut and saddles. Now that this guitar is perfectly set up, it's time to finally take a listen to hear the difference. And boy, am I dying to do so. I'm really excited to tell you that this next portion of the video has been made possible by String Joy Strings. I contacted them over a year ago to tell them what I was planning and I asked if they could help. They said that they weren't able to sponsor the video but did agree to send uh, some strings to help with the sound comparisons. In my opinion, they make the best strings on the market for acoustic or electric, and they have the best customer service. I've reached out to them a number of times and they've always helped me out right away. I'm going to be using Stringjoy's Foxwood coated phosphor bronze strings, which are their revolutionary take on coated strings. I'll be using the 13 to 56 balanced tension set. They don't sound or feel like coated strings that you might have heard before. They just sound great and they last an absurdly long time. Thank you so much, Stringjoy Strings. The reason I reached out to Stringjoy was because I wanted to have a completely fair comparison with a brand new set of strings for each new nut and saddle material. I didn't want to potentially bias a sound sample by having a set of strings that had been installed and removed a bunch of times. Because of this, I've used a more affordable set of strings during the previous videos. For today's videos, I have installed a new set of string joist strings with each nut and saddle material type and then finalized the setup and then gave everything a once over to make sure everything was good and then even with each other. And then I played the guitar for about 20 minutes to let the strings stretch in before doing the sound samples. Here's how the sound comparison is gonna work. For each nut and saddle material, I will play a couple simple chords. Then I will strum a simple chord progression. Then some open chords. And then I'll play some single notes. The last thing I will do with each of them is to just play them 
and see what type of music comes out of me. Does one sound inspire me more than another, so to speak? At the end, I will give you my own honest impressions, since sometimes not everything translates across a YouTube video. And I'll let you know which I will be keeping on this guitar. So without further ado, let's get to the sound samples.
So what are my thoughts after hearing all three different materials back to back? Well, to be honest, you know, I didn't actually try them back to back. I had them spaced out with a couple days gap between them. I haven't listened to the sound clips back to back. I'll do that in editing. No surprise, the plastic actually sounded pretty good. And I was also surprised that in my opinion, the tusk, when I put it on, I, I was shocked at how big of a difference there was. I put that on after the plastic and I was just blown away. I was, I was like, man, this thing sounds amazing. But the more I played it, I started to notice that there was this kind of thing going on in the high end. Like, the, like you know, they, they talk about the upper mids and the high end. You know, some people might call it like sparkle or whatever. But I will say I didn't like it. it to me, it was too much. Um, and when I put the bone, nut, and saddle on this guitar, all of that went away. It, it mellowed those uh, the high end and the upper mids and highs just a tiny bit. And all of a sudden, to me, this guitar just sounded right. I'm not saying one is better or the other. They both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, but to me, the bone sounded right. Um, another thing I noticed while playing, um, and I don't know, maybe I'm making this up, but I felt like the tusk, when I started to dig in and play really aggressively, which is something I do with my playing style, I'll go from very soft and dynamic to very uh, aggressive and loud with my playing style. I felt like the tusk didn't handle that as well and kind of compressed a little bit, whereas the bone really gave me that depth of volume and, and really uh, was able to go with me where I wanted it to go, especially with this guitar with the ebony size and back, which is you know kind of why I liked this guitar in the first place, is when you push it, it can take it and it can give it back to you. And I felt like I wasn't getting that with the Tusk. So those are my thoughts. I'm excited to see what it's gonna sound like in post and we'll hear your thoughts. Well, what did you think? Were you able to notice a difference? Did the plastic sound as bad as you thought it might? Did Tusk sound as good as you thought it would? Is bone worth the time and the effort? Look, I can definitely see the benefits of each material. Look, if you're in a rush and you have a budget instrument or a customer who needs the work done but is hard up for cash, hey, the plastic group makes sense. If you have the time and the skill, the bone root is classic and sounds great and it's gonna last the life of the guitar. And it has a pretty low materials cost. And if you don't mind spending a little bit more money, even a relative beginner can install a tusk nut, which takes a lot of the guesswork out of shaping the saddle and slotting the nut, and it still sounds really good. Each choice has its place in the toolbox for a guitar tech, and hopefully this video has helped you to understand the differences that they offer, and this series has helped to equip you to be able to install them properly on your own instruments. Hey, tell me which was your favorite down in the comments and why you felt like it sounded the best. What have you been putting in your instruments and why? Also, let me know if you have any questions. I will do my best to answer them. If you like videos like this, make sure to subscribe to this channel and even hit that bell icon to be notified of future videos. Otherwise, this has been Adam from Miller's Custom Guitars reminding you, don't be a jerk.